sponsored by Ting. The iOS 14 public beta is just going live now. So if you're interested in test driving Apple's next generation software for the iPhone, strap yourself in. Also, I'll be doing separate previews for iPadOS, macOS, watchOS, and all the AirPods, HomePod Home, and CarPlays. So hit the subscribe button and bell right now so you don't miss any of them. To get on Apple's software testing programs, any or all of them, go to beta.apple.com and sign up. Just remember that beta really does mean beta, so put it on a secondary iPhone or iPod Touch, nothing you absolutely need to depend on for your daily life or livelihood. I mean, the beta has been really solid so far, way more like iOS 12 than iOS 13, but you never know what'll happen from one beta update to the next. And remember, developers can't update for iOS 14 in the App Store until after it goes into general release this fall. So if anything doesn't work, that's all on you, not on them iOS 14 basically runs on all the same iPhones that iOS 13 did. That means every iPhone from the 2015 iPhone 6S to the 2016 original iPhone SE on up. Also the current generation iPod Touch 7. Apple's willingness and ability to update older phones with the latest software is once again, just totally unmatched. Now, for almost a decade and a half, the home screen has been an uninterrupted grid of tiny little app icons. But now Apple has gone and punched like widget sized holes through the entire thing. You can still swipe over to the minus one homepage to see all the widgets, but now on the iPhone, touch and hold on any widget you like, and you can drag it right onto the home screen as well. It's still Apple, so you can't drop them quite anywhere you like. The grid just makes more room for them on the sides and has full rows, but they'll still attract straight to magnetic top left. You can also go into jiggly mode, and yes, it's jiggly mode. That's what Steve Jobs called it at the beginning and it's what Craig Federighi is calling it now. Just don't worry about it. But you can now go into jiggly mode and the fastest way to do that, because icons now give you just a bunch of options, is to touch and hold on an empty area of the screen. Then you're right in. At that point, tap the plus button at the top left, pull up the widget gallery to see all the different variations of all the different widgets and then drag and drop any of them anywhere you want within the grid, of course, again. Now, if you have an Apple Watch and these new widgets look a lot like those old complications to you, that's because you're incredibly observant and that's precisely what they are. Apple just brought over the killer design language, information density, and glanceability from the complications and have made them the standard for widgets across all of the platforms. But because they come from complications, much of the previous iOS widget interactivity is just gone, blown away. Because this is a beta, unless you're on some test flight or something, we only have Apple's newfangled widgets to work with for now. But old style widgets still work and should keep on working for about a year or so. For those new style widgets though, apps push updates to them, which then get shown in chronological order. Whatever is being shown can then deep link back into the app. Small widgets have a single deep link, but the medium and large size widgets can have separate deep links for each section. And if something new is added, the widgets can be updated. So a small podcast widget could just link you right back to the now playing screen where a bigger one could offer you the current show and the next three show pages as well. It's super power efficient, but at the cost of that old style interactivity. And I don't know if that's philosophical because Apple has always seen the homepage as more of a portal, not a destination, or if it's practical because it'll take time to add that functionality back to the previously watch only system. We'll just have to wait and see. But if you want your interactive widgets back, just drop a like below. To save space and prevent you having to pick favorites, you can drop multiple same size widgets one on top of the other to form what's called a stack. Then swipe through them on your homepage and you can hold down to remove or reorder any widget any way you want. There's even a smart stack that cycles between widgets intelligently for you based on things like time and location and previous behavior and priorities set by the apps themselves. For example, if you have a meeting coming up, calendar can say, me, me, my turn, and jump right to the top of the stack. Now, real talk, I've never used widgets much on Android and I've owned Android phones for a decade. And I don't know if I'm gonna use them much on the iPhone either, except, except for the Siri suggested apps widget. That one disappears right onto your home screen and looks like just a normal set of home screen apps, but it uses the same intelligence to try to predict which apps you'll most want to use next. And if you ever see an app you never want to see again, you can tap and hold it and banish it. So you can customize it somewhat too, until at least you next re-add that widget. I've dropped two of them on my home screen and they don't duplicate apps, which is great. They also almost always have the app I'm looking for, even if it does take me a second longer to zero in on where exactly it is. Now, I don't know how many non-nerds will use widgets either, or even find them, know that they can use them, because historically those numbers just have never been high. But as a nerd, I'm super happy that they're finally here. 
And like with Control Center, Notification Center, and a bunch of other more advanced, more sophisticated systems, I'm even super happier that they're completely out of the way for absolutely anyone who has absolutely no interest in them. Because surfacing functional complexity through interface depth is just exactly how you mature an operating system for existing users, the more niche users, without making it impenetrable to the new, more casual users as well. And hey, I'm willing to be convinced about this whole widget thing, so let me know your current favorites and the ones you're most waiting for in the comments below. If you had default apps on your iOS 14 bingo card, then go ahead and circle it, but only a little, because you'll soon be able to set whatever email client you want, including Gmail and Outlook, and whatever web browser you want, including Chrome and Edge, as your default. Why only mail and browsers? Because those are the ones Apple got the most requests for and the one they want to test out first. But that just means you have to keep asking for things like maps, music, and calendar as well. And why only soon and not now in the beta? Because developers have to update their apps with a flag that says they're available for default mail or browser status. And Apple wants to make sure they're real apps, like Google and Microsoft apps, no problem. But some scammer app that just wants to steal all your email or take over your Amazon affiliate cookies or spam you with ads or redirect you to phishing sites, well, those just better be squashed and hard before Apple ever lets them anywhere near the App Store. Now, I value Apple's commitment to privacy, so I'll be sticking with Mail and Safari. But I love that Apple can't rest on their default laurels anymore and now has to actively fight for every user, which will hopefully result in better apps for everyone. Let me know what, if anything, you'll be changing your defaults to and which default apps you want to see next in the comments. Okay, confession. My home screens are graveyards where so often apps are just downloaded and left to die. Sometimes I'll search for them later if I need them. Other times I'll just do a fresh install and blast them all clean and start over. But with iOS 14, Apple is using the same kind of Siri suggested smarts to impose, I'll say it again, a little Marie Kondo style organization on all of our apps. Now, I never really use the very basic app drawer on Android. Both on the iPhone and on Android, I just tend to search whatever I can't immediately find. And that kind of search, by the way, is getting better in iOS 14 as well. In addition to knowledge search, essentially type to Siri, you can now search inside apps and use search to quick launch apps. Basically what it's been on the Mac for the last few years now, it's great to finally have all of that on the iPhone as well. But when it comes to things like app library versus app drawer, it's the implementation and not the idea that matters. So the app library sits all the way to the right of the home screen stack. But now you can hide all those intermediate graveyard-like home screen pages if you want to. Just go into jiggly mode, tap the little navigational dots above the dock and uncheck any screens you no longer want to ever be seen. That way the app library can be as few swipes from home screen prime as you want it to be. And for any pages you choose to leave, just tap and hold those little dots and slide your finger back and forth to super scrub through them faster than ever. Now the library looks like giant folders with full sized apps in them with regular sized folders and tiny apps in them as well. Basically apps all the way down. Tap on a regular sized app and you're teleported straight into that app. Tap on a tiny app though, and you open the folder. Yeah, it's a bit much, but you do get the hang of it, if not always quickly. The first app group is Suggested, which works just like the Siri Suggested Apps widget. The next is Recently Added, which is great if you, like me, download a bunch of stuff, get distracted, forget what you downloaded, realize it didn't go at the absolute end of all of your apps, but rather whatever slot was just left free somewhere on a screen in between, and then spend forever too long trying to find it. Now it's all just in recent apps. The rest of the groups are categorized based on the apps inside, and often not that well. I'm guessing it pulls from the categories developers add to their apps when they upload them, but the results just don't always make sense. So here's hoping Apple requires and honors a primary category, gets smarter about sorting, or here's an idea, lets us change the labels or hold on an app and choose wrong category, wrong category, bad AI, bad AI, and just help train it to be smarter. There's also a search box on the top, but unlike the regular search box, if you tap into it, you now get a full alphabetized list of all your apps, like watchOS got previously. I don't know that I'll ever use it, but my inner bring order to the galaxy or just loves knowing that it's there. Ever since Apple introduced extensibility in iOS 8, basically breaking apart binary app blobs into discrete sets of functionality that could be surfaced in other apps, even on other devices like Apple Watch or CarPlay, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for the apps themselves to be downloadable in anything other than their binary blob form. You know, so you don't have to figure out what they're called, find them, wait for them to install, set up an account, set up a payment system, do just a ton of overhead just to get something quick done. And App Clips may, and I emphasize on the may because we've all been here before, finally be what exactly we've been waiting for. 
developers spin them out of their main apps and they have to be really small, so they're really fast. You can grab them from the web or from inside maps or in real life from an NFC tap or QR code or a new hybrid Apple code, even from messages if someone sends one to you. Then you just tap the card, sign in with Apple, use Apple Pay, and you're done. Like done. You can even go to the app library to use them again or download the full app. Or at least we'll be able to once apps update to include them when iOS 14 goes live this fall. And situations where they'll most be valuable, like travel, becomes possible for all of us again. But all the fingers crossed this idea takes off because even though this is still on a phone screen, we're gonna need tech just exactly like this for the augmented reality future. You know that feeling when you're about to tap something on your screen and a call comes in and it's too late to peel off and you just tap the hang up button before you can stop yourself? Well, that's finally been fixed or at least mitigated. Now, when the phone rings or the FaceTime comes in, instead of a full screen takeover, you get a fairly standard banner notification. Same with apps like Skype come iOS 14's release this fall. You can swipe it away to get rid of it like any banner or pull it down to get the classic full screen interface and options like messaging we all know and sometimes use. Same with Siri, it's no longer a full screen takeover. Now it's a swirling powerball of assistant might that just bursts out on top of the dock and gives you results in very similar banner sized overlays. Now, the ball does look kind of weird to me sitting halfway on top of the dock. So I'm hoping Apple tweaks it or just blanks out the dock and lets it settle into the middle of it. Likewise, you can see the screen beneath Siri now, but you still can't interact with it. And because you can see it, you think you can interact with it. But when you do, it just obliterates the Siri result and you have to start all over. Yes, like an animal, an animal muttering, can you just not? Flicking away the banner would be more consistent with notification behavior, but I can see how it would get annoying. Maybe letting me touch and hold to pin it would be the best or, I don't know, the worst of both worlds. Or let me grab a result I really want to persist and drop it as a widget so I can refer back to it again and again. Picture in picture on the iPhone works mostly like it has on the iPad for the last low many years. Go to a video in Safari or any app that eventually supports it, make the video full screen, exit the app, and then it goes picture in picture. You can't put it anywhere on the screen, but you can move it between the corners, pinch to make it bigger or smaller, hide it off to the side or bring it back out, and tap a button to close it or return to the host app. You can even use it with FaceTime so you can leave the app and do something else without it showing a big pause button and writing you out to everybody else on the call which is legit great. But I'm also hoping we get a button in the default media controller that lets us just tap to picture in picture anytime we want as well. It'd be the same amount of steps, but way less cognitive load if you're thinking PIP to begin with. Either way, I love, all caps love that it's finally on the iPhone, even if I loathe that the YouTube app will likely just never add support for it and just hit that like button to show YouTube exactly how much you want it. If you've ever had to scroll, scroll, scroll past parents and carrier spam and work groups and Charles Boyle to try to find that important but infrequent message thread, then pin conversations in iOS 14 are for you. And really for all of us. Just swipe from left to right to pin, tap and hold to unpin. You can pin up to nine conversations at the top of the message stack, like chat heads frozen in time and space, and they'll sync across your iPad and Mac if you have one or both of those. So you can not only find those convos fast, but see recent messages, emoji reactions, even typing indicators right on the heads. For group messages, you can set up a group photo to make them easier to tell apart. So you don't accidentally send something to your PTA that you really meant for your meme group, even if a few of the people in them overlap. You can now also mention specific people with or without an at symbol first. Just type their name, tap their face, and they'll be notified. Even if they turn general group alerts off and only left say my name alerts on. You can also reply inline to older specific messages. Just tap and hold on the message you want to thread and choose reply. It's super useful if a conversation is mutating rapidly or you just want to add something back later. The interface is a bit confusing to me though, and everyone who's not on the beta is still gonna see it in chronological order. So I found it extremely helpful to keep over adding context, at least for now. Memoji have gotten 10 new hairstyles now, and while I don't think Apple would ever admit this or say this, I found many of them are just perfect for all the new longer shelter in place hair many of us have been rocking lately. Also, 18 new headwear options now, including bicycle helmet, old timey wimey aviator goggles, and even a chef's hat, which is just chef's kiss. There are nine new age levels now, from baby to gamma and gampa, three new emoji stickers, hug, gasp, and fist bump, and masks for those of us with empathy and sense enough to just wanna show how important our collective health and economy wearing them really is. There's also a new emoji picker, which 
finally, oh so very finally, has a search box like Mac OS has enjoyed for a good long while now, and it makes it super easier. Yes, barely an inconvenience to find your less recently, less frequently used emoji, especially as the amount of emoji continues to soar year after year. Camera is getting faster, up to 90% on shots, hitting up to 4 frames per second. Portrait mode is 15% faster, shot to shot as well. You can also choose to prioritize speed over processing if that's what you want. Quick Take Video is now supported on the iPhone XR, iPhone XS, and iPhone XS Max. Also, Quick Take can now be set to just the volume down button, so you get back burst mode on the volume up. And all iPhone models now get on quick toggles for video resolutions and frame as well. Just tap the readout to toggle the setting. Night mode on iPhone 11 will help you stay steadier or let you cancel out faster, and you can choose to capture mirrored selfies if the difference between preview and photos has just always thrown you. In photos, you can now filter your collection by favorites, edited, videos, and photos, and sort any album from oldest to newest or vice versa. You can also add captions to photos to better describe them for others or better recall the important details for yourself. Search for the captions and they'll sync across all of your devices. New Maps, already rolled out across the US, is coming to the UK, Ireland, and Canada this year as well. And Maps is adding cycling directions in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and a number of cities in China, including Beijing and Shanghai. You'll get several options for the routes, including the fastest, but also easier ones if there's less elevation or stairs to navigate, or bike lanes that might be safer. If you have an electric vehicle, you can enter the type and Maps will add compatible charging stops along your routes. And if your city uses congestion zones, Maps can route you around them. Also, it'll let you know if you're approaching speed or red light cameras and where they're located. If and when traveling becomes a thing again, new guides chock full of local attractions can help you choose which city you want to go to and which restaurants and sites you want to visit when you get there. Also, if you're walking in a city where the buildings are interfering with GPS, you know, like when the blue circle just covers an entire three block radius, no matter which way you go, it's just always the wrong way. Well, you can now use the camera to scan those buildings around you and reverse look around a far more precise location. And as much as I never want to be the person scanning skylines as passers-by tourists shame me like I'm unfolding an old school paper map, I've so needed this in New York and San Francisco so often. Previously, we got a new measure app to show off all the improvements in ARKit. This year, we're getting a new Translate app to take advantage of some of the new Siri features and on-device improvements. You can choose your language, the language you want things translated into, even download the language if you want or need everything done on device. For privacy, sure, but also if you just worry about the stability or even availability of your internet signal. You can dictate what you want translated, type it in as text, save favorite phrases to refer back to them in a pinch, even get dictionary definitions if you want or need them. You can also just rotate to landscape to get big honking text signs so you can better get the attention of whoever you want to talk to. And if you want to start a conversation with them, you can also rotate to landscape to watch the screen split wide open and tap the mic to start playing Pong between your language and theirs. And it'll even auto detect the language to keep up between the two of you. It's nowhere nearly a babblefish or everything but Klingon universal translator, but I just love that Google and now Apple are pushing us closer to that sci-fi future. And again, a future that'll be just so much better when audio and video augmented reality really start to become a thing. Accessibility always gets some of the coolest, most cutting edge features because the team's driving goal is to make the iPhone easier to use for everyone. This year, that includes double and triple tap shortcuts on any iPhone with Face ID and the new tap to wake accelerometer feature that came with it. Just go into settings, accessibility, touch, and pick things you want to launch like control center or notification center. Then just tap twice or three times on the back of your phone. And it takes a second to work, but saves you several seconds and taps you'd otherwise have to do to get that work done over and over again. And yeah, let me know what you're setting this on in the comments. If FaceTime detects you using sign language, it'll make you more prominent so everyone else can make your signs out just way more easily. And headphone accommodations let you customize exactly the audio experience you want, amplifying soft sounds, adjusting frequencies, even making a personal profile. And there's also voiceover recognition, where machine learning analyzes the screen even if apps or websites haven't done their jobs labeling buttons or elements appropriately, or if a bug has come up that just interferes with them. It'll also do similar for images, explaining every element in a photo that it can identify, as well as reading any text that it makes out. You can now set up accessibility to recognize alarms, pets, appliances, running water, crying, and screaming, and alert you. And it's just 
beyond terrific. I sincerely love this stuff and this team. Apple's been talking about privacy by design for years. It basically means every feature is created with privacy in mind each step along the way, not just bolted on, often badly at the end. But it's also come to mean new and creative ways to name and shame, or disclose and force consent, the apps and services that aren't doing everything they can for our privacy, even including Apple's own. This year, that includes tracking control. So just like an app has to ask permission to use your location in the real world, when you launch it, an app now has to ask your permission to cookie you and track you across the internet as you move from site to site and app to app as well. And real talk, I can't imagine any legit advertiser who's proud of their business model and not trying desperately to hide or deceive any of us would object to any of this in any way at all. For location, you can also choose to give only an approximate location instead of a precise one. So an app only sees the neighborhood that you're in, not the room. Take that, Tim Hortons. For copy and paste access, iOS will now tell you if and when an app is reading your clipboard. So if you copy a private photo or message, then switch apps, that other app can't just suck it up as well. If you're using iCloud Clipboard to paste from another device, it'll tell you the device as well. And just like last year when Bluetooth Disclosure caught a bunch of apps trying to use beacons to get around location permissions, this year apps like TikTok and LinkedIn have already been caught reading our clipboards without our consent, meaning without us choosing to paste anything. And they've been fixing it, fast. That's what all this stuff is meant to do. So more like it, please. If anything is using the mic, including Siri after it activates, you'll see an orange dot in the status bar, green if anything is using the camera. The photo library is also getting limited access. Before you had to choose between basically yes and no access. Now you can choose to only allow select photos at select time. So you're in control. And just like nutrition labels on foods, apps now have to provide privacy information on the app store so you can see what information they're collecting, where it's going, and get details on how it's gonna be used. And if an app adds support for signing in with Apple, you can now switch from your old login to that system to better protect your privacy going forward and increase your convenience. Now, that's not even all the new features in iOS 14. I'm saving some of them, like Game Center, Safari, Shortcuts, and more for iPadOS preview coming next. So really, make sure you're subscribed with the bell gizmo on or YouTube probably won't even tell you when it comes out. Just like your carriers won't tell you about Ting, which can help you save money no matter which iPhone or which version of iOS you're running. Especially if you're working from home right now, which is tons of Wi-Fi available and no need to pay for any more data than you actually use. Same with talk, same with text. Ting offers coverage on Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. So no matter where you are or if and when you actually go somewhere, you'll have more service options in more places. And it works with almost any phone. The iPhone, sure, absolutely. The Google Pixel, Samsung Galaxy, pretty much everything. And it's super easy to get started. Just go to renee.ting.com, create an account. They send you a SIM card. You put that in your phone and you're good to go. And if you have any issues, they have award-winning customer support ready and happy to help you out. The average Ting bill is just $23 a month with no contracts, no commitments. And since you're watching this video, you can get a $25 service credit to try them out. Bring your own phone, bring your own number too if you want to. Just go to renee.ting.com or click the link in the description. See how much you can save and get $25 off. Thanks Ting, thanks to all of you for your support. Hit the iOS 14 playlist for more. See you next video.